And okay, there we go, we are recording. So hello everybody and welcome to the Princeton Preservation Group's Susan Schwartzberg Memorial Lecture Series. My name is Melissa Ziobro and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch. I'll be co-hosting today's series with Gary, but I'm just kind of tech support. This is really Gary's show. He's the brains behind this operation, and he's done a tremendous job finding a wonderful speaker for you today. Um, before I turn things over to Gary, uh, just two pieces of kind of tech I'd like to run by you. Uh, you all came into the Zoom room muted. Please keep yourselves muted until we get to the question and answer portion of today's program. And please note that we are recording. So if you want to keep your camera off or anything, please feel free to do that. We're going to record today's session and future lectures, and they will be available on the Monmouth University Department of History and Anthropology YouTube page in a channel dedicated to Princeton Preservation Group. So. With that, I will turn things over to Gary Soretsky, who I'm sure most of you know is the recently retired, longtime Monmouth County archivist. So, Gary, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about PPG, the lecture series, and today's wonderful speaker? Hello? I will. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa, and thank you for hosting this event. Since 2005, I've had the privilege of serving as president of the Princeton Preservation Group and was one of the original members. Founded by Susan Garrison Swartzberg, then preservation librarian for Alexander Library at Rutgers University, PPG has been meeting regularly since 1983. Susan was an enthusiastic advocate for preservation and inspired many students to follow in her footsteps. PPG is an outgrowth of get-togethers in her home in Princeton where her graduate students in her preservation of library materials class would give reports on their term projects to other students and local professionals. She established the PPG to provide an opportunity for professionals to share information about projects, events, and techniques. Since 1983, more than 130 programs, some with several speakers, have been given on a wide range of preservation and conservation topics. Continuing Swartzberg's tradition, Speakers have never been paid, and as a result, dues have stayed at $5 per year, and there are no plans for an increase. If you are not a member, I would like to encourage you to join PPG so that you will be informed about future programs. Also, if you would like to be a presenter, we are open to proposals. On behalf of the PPG Program Committee, that also includes Tim Corliss, Vice President, and Evelyn Frangakis, Program Chair, I'm very pleased to introduce Halal Yadin as the speaker for our first Zoom program. Halal is also the first speaker in our new series, the Susan Schwartzberg Memorial Lecture, that provides opportunities for students and recent graduates to share their preservation work experiences. Information about the series, past lectures, and membership is available on our webpage, princetonpreservation.org. Halel Yadin is a distance MLIS student at the University of Missouri with an emphasis in archival studies. She is also completing the Society of American Archivists Digital Archives Specialist Certificate thanks to a training grant from the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Network. The funding was provided in the context of her position as an archivist at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York City. She will be speaking about her work there processing born digital manuscript collections. I'm pleased to turn it over to Hello. All right, thank you, Gary. I'll just share my screen. So I think that Gary covered everything in the introduction about me, um, but I work at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research as an archivist. I am an MLIS student, um, and I used funding from the funding to complete the Society of American Archivists certificate to sort of combine school work and work work um, and do a born digital manuscript collection. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So before we get started, I would like to give a quick introduction to the YIVO Institute. We are among other things, the world's largest archive of Eastern European history and Jewish culture. So that means that virtually every type of record is ostensibly within our scope. 
including born digital material. And born digital material is just material that was originally produced in digital form, as opposed to converted from a print or analog format. Our born digital workflows are not as formalized as we'd like them to be, but a massive proportion of records being produced today are born digital. So this is something that's only going to become more and more pressing for us. One thing that I am especially concerned about in the context of U.S. collections is literary or other author collections. Um, they've always been a particular strength of Evos. We have hundreds of them. Um, some of them are from literary authors, but we also have them from academics, playwrights, poets, rabbis, and they date back to 1567. So I'm sort of using manuscript collections as a catch-all to describe that, and that is something that I'm very keen to get sort of formalized, um, because the truth is the equivalents today are probably not being written longhand. I would say that virtually all manuscript collections being produced today are born digital, um, either through a word processing program or in a cloud application like Google Drive, which is what we'll be talking about. So as I'm working on the Digital Archive Specialist Certificate, I wanted to apply what I'm learning to an actual issue. So I, we sort of made a little project at Evo to process a born digital manuscript collection. So my boss, Stephanie Halpern, the director of the Evo Archives, very kindly lent me her dissertation research, which she did all in Google Drive. So I took this, and the goal was to make it a process collection. Um, a few disclaimers as we get into this. This is not a real collection in the case, in the sense that it's not actually being processed for public for public consumption. Um, I'm sure Dr. Halpern will eventually donate her papers to Evo, but she's got a, a lot of time left to make more papers, so we're not there yet. Um, and we're not actively accessioning born digital material. We do get it. People do donate it pretty regularly, but we're not actively accessioning because we don't feel that our tech setup is at 100%. So some of what I'll be talking about is our plans and not what I literally did with this material. But I will, I will note that when appropriate. The last thing to note is that I'm not going to go into any tremendous depth about any sort of technical aspect of this just because of time but I will put my contact information up at the end. And if you want to get the slides, I have links to more in-depth resources in the speaker notes for each slide. So in addition to the Q&A, that is also an option. So process of processing. I wanna talk about tools for a minute. Um, some of these are aspirational. Um, some of them are not necessarily relevant to this collection. Um, but I did want to mention everything just because I don't, I don't know how much background people have with porn digital materials. So one thing that we did not use, it was not relevant to this collection because we got it from the source directly from Google Drive is a write blocker. And that relates to drives like an external hard drive or a USB stick. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It blocks write access to the drive so that you only have a read access. And that means that you can't make any changes when you're working with a collection. So if we got a born digital collection that was, you know, somebody gave us an external hard drive full of Word documents, we would use a write blocker to ensure that when we were working with it and transferring it to a Evo workstation, we weren't accidentally making any changes to the materials. The other is an isolated workstation. We don't have one right now, um, but that would be the ideal setup. This is just some software that comes up commonly. Some of this I use personally, some of this I don't, um, but all of this is free and freely available. So I thought I would share. Uh, BitCurator is a, a, what is it called? A digital forensic program. So it tells you what's on a drive. It gives you all the information about all the files on there. OpenRefine, I use a lot. That is a tool to clean up messy data. And Rename Master is a bulk renaming program. So to start with, oh, one other thing to note is that we use Outlook as our email client, but you can attach Google Drive, you can attach Google emails to non-Google emails. 
So we're going to set up a born digital inbox in our Outlook client, but then attach a attach a Google account to that and work with future Google Drive collections all in one place. So for this collection, to do the initial survey, I immediately downloaded everything straight from Google Drive, just downloaded everything as a PDF in one go, because I wanted to spend as little time in the original Google Drive as possible. Um, it's very easy to hit one button and you've edited the document. And given how Google Drive works, if I edit the document as a user, it kind of changes the whole essence of the document. Uh, you could do the same thing by making a copy of the entire folder and working in Google Drive with the copy. Um, but do know that you will need full access as an editor to the original documents. And we'll get into the reasons later. And while we're on the topic of PDFs, one thing I want to note, I think there are seven PDF formats. And for this kind of collection, our preferred PDF format would be PDFA, which fittingly stands for PDF archival. That is the ISO standard for PDF preservation. And it doesn't include some features that regular PDFs have that are not really suitable for long-term preservation. So things like encryption, font linking, those are not available in PDFA. And PDFAs can't be altered. If you have a PDFA and you try to change it, a little pop-up, I'll warn you that it will no longer be a certified PDFA. So that would be, that's our preference. And of course, you can have things in Google Drive that aren't just Google Docs. The big, uh, the big other format that came up in this collection is images. Um, so for preservation purposes, we would do the same thing that we do with any other image and uh, save that as an uncompressed TIFF file. So one thing that we didn't do, but I do wanna note again, just as a general born digital thing, um, is generating checksums to ensure file fixity. So we didn't have to really do this because again, we got all the files from the source, but if we had gotten the files from a drive, this is definitely something that I would have done. A checksum, a checksum is a unique code assigned to a document and it's used to check for fixity, which is essentially file stability. So if I had gotten all of the documents on a drive, I would have generated checksums on the drive, generated checksums once they were transferred to a Evo workstation, and then cross-checked and made sure that nothing happened that altered the documents during the transfer process. Finally, for metadata, not really, I think, a huge difference with any other collection. Uh, we would embed technical metadata into the PDFs. So Nevo has an in-house digital lab, so there is very much a process for this. The current uh, characteristics that they make sure to embed are hardware and software information, resolution and bit depth. Not all of those are relevant to a Google Doc, but the ones that are, we would do. And the same thing for descriptive metadata, not super different than any other collection. We would compile the descriptive metadata in a DAX compliant finding aid in archive space. So this for me is really the meat of what I was trying to figure out. What, what is the best way to do this? And that's preserving different drafts and comments. Because um, having access to all the prior versions and comments of a document in Google Drive is a huge boon. But there's, it, there doesn't seem to be a really easy way to actually preserve all of that. So this is what I think would make sense for Evo. I'll sort of walk you through things that will not work, but that did come up. Uh, so one of the things that is available as an option is to preserve your Google Drive materials as web pages. Just web archive them using whatever web archiving tool you would otherwise use. Um, I don't think that this made sense for you though, but it is an option. Um, sorry, excuse me. So what I wanted to do was have everything as a PDF so we could put it into, have it 
show up in an archive space finding aid the way that any other manuscript collection would when patrons are using them. So there are two separate issues. One is preserving all the various versions, which I call drafts, and one is preserving the comments. Um, these are all a little cumbersome. I don't think anybody has created scripts. I couldn't find anything that has been created, but if you know of anything that would <laughs> save any time on this, let me know. It looks like there's nothing, so you sort of have to do things one by one. To save different drafts, you have to go to the document's edit history and click each version and save each one as an individual PDF. I could not find a way to do it in bulk. And this incidentally is one of the reasons that you do need access to the original documents so you can access those original versions. If you make a copy and you work in the copy, that copy is its own document that doesn't have all of the original work that went into whatever you copied. Um, preserving comments is also a little tricky. There are two options that I found that were workable. And I think that they actually work best in tandem, but you could do one or the other. So I would want to know when I say preserving comments, I want to preserve comments in the document itself. If you just download a PDF or a doc straight from Google Docs, the file will be there, but it will really only be viewable within the file reader. So kind of separate from the text, I wanted the comments fully as text in the PDF that I would ingest. Um, so one option is to download the comments, download the document as plain text before converting to PDF. And I'll show you what that looks like. I did a little test case because all of the documents were long and they didn't fit onto one screen, but this is what it would look like. So this is, this is my original Google Doc. This is my text, this is my comment. I want it all in one place. So I initially download it as a plain text file and my plain text file comes out like this. Everything is text together, referenced to where it originally was. And then this is what my PDF looks like when I convert this, this text file. Oops, I wanna go backwards. There we go, this text file to PDF. Um, so that's one option. The next option is to have the donor also donate Google Drive metadata when they donate the collection, aka give you access to their Google Drive. Um, so patrons can do, there's a, you can go to takeout.google.org, you can request your own Google Drive metadata. I'll show you what it looks like. I did not do this with Stephanie, so I'm just, I pulled from, from my own so that you could see what it looks like. But essentially, here's one of my, this is, you get uh, delivered all of the files in your Google Drive, whatever folders you request, as just a zip file. I, you know, I decompressed it, I unzipped it, I put everything where I wanted it. This is one of the folders that Google delivered me from my Google Drive. So I highlighted the two things that were initially Google Docs, and they had comments, and Google Drive delivered the comments as a separate sheet. It actually delivered them as a Microsoft Edge web page, HTML web page. Not sure why, but it's totally workable. So let me show you what that looks like. So we're gonna look at this final teaching philosophy. This is the document. This is exactly what was initially in Google Drive. But then when I click on the file comments, I have all of the comments, even the ones that were resolved. I have the dates, I have my little picture that I made the comments. And this is from a different file, but what's also nice is that it's not just you, the creator. It's every, it's every comment that was added by anybody. You can see who wrote what when, who resolved what when, it's all in that file. So to me, I think having all three things, the actual document, the plain text comments, and these, these um, Google Drive archive comments that you can get directly from Google, 
I think having them all in one packet is the best option. So I think the, the plain text is pretty limited. It doesn't have the users, it doesn't have the dates. All of that is coming from the, the, um, the one that you get from Google Drive. But if you see, this actually tells you exactly where each comment is. With some of the resolved comments, it's you can't really tell where they came from if the text has changed. So I think if you have all of it together, the researcher can sort of piece together a pretty robust picture of the life cycle of the document. Um, and also, if you can't get the archive from the patron for whatever reason, I think having just the plain text is also great. But as much as possible, if um, if you can have as much of this as you as you can obtain, I think having it all in place is really useful. Um, so what I decided to do, so now we'll, we have one initial document and we have multiple versions of this document and we have two separate files with comments from the document. Um, so what I decided to do is sort of treat each document as a subfolder, put all of that together in a subfolder so that it's all in one place for the researcher, and then they can really trace the life cycle of the whole document, all the versions, all the comments. And to me, that's really the value of a born digital manuscript collection is you can really get a sense of all of the history of the edits and the thought process for this person that you're researching. So a few processing considerations. Um, this is probably self-evident to a lot of you. Took me a beat to get it, so I will say it. Um, but if you download files to work with or you make a copy to work with, you've lost all of your dates. Your dates are now whenever you downloaded everything. So you do need access to the original. That's the other big reason. You need access to all the original files so that you can see the dates. Um, there's no real way, I think, to process without poking around in the Google Drive a little bit. So just got to be careful. I did find a script. We just found it, so I haven't run it yet. So I have not, I can't vouch for it, but I put it in the speaker notes. Um, somebody did write a script to get a, um, a file tree from a Google Drive folder. So you could do that initially and have all of your original dates and things right there. Um, but I think for for reference, and if you want to double check things, you will have to be in the actual Google Drive for dates. The other thing is institutional considerations. This is not something we've come across yet because, again, we're not actively accessioning. But as I said, we do work with a lot of professors who may well be working in institutional Google Drives or institutional Box accounts or whatever their whatever their institution uses, and I foresee there being permissions issues that we would have to work out as part of the donation process. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing is what kinds of materials to keep. As I said, I think in a lot of ways, processing one digital collections is pretty similar to processing any other collection. But one thing that is uh, one thing that is important to keep in mind for me is that it's very tempting to just keep everything because it's so easy. There are still space considerations with digital storage, but they're much less pressing, at least at Evo, than the space considerations we have for physical storage. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to keep everything. So this is a research collection, and Evo historically has erred on the side of keeping all the research material because it constitutes its own kind of valuable curated collection in and of itself. Um, so that said, even though we err on the side of keeping the actual research materials, even if they're published materials by other people, um, we did talk some of this. So research materials in this collection included photographs of archival materials from Evo, historic newspaper articles pulled from ProQuest, academic articles, full dissertations, and books. We definitely did not archive the full books because I'm not a librarian and nobody wants me to deal with copyright. But the same thing for dissertations and full articles. That was sort of too redundant. 
Um, but the newspapers and the photographs from the Eagle archives, even though it's redundant in a way, it's our own stuff. Whoever is accessing this collection through Evo can ostensibly access whatever Stephanie was looking at through Evo. It's all in one place in the way that she sort of curated it as a researcher. Also, none of the collections that she had photographed when she was doing her research have been digitized. So they're not really as available. So we decided to keep all of that. But I, that's just my little sort of disclaimer <laughs> that it is very tempting to keep everything, um, but we still don't need to do that. If I would toss it in a paper collection or more accurately read it or de session it, we don't need to keep it even though it's easier in a, in a digital form. And finally, I do wanna talk about the basics of Vivo's digital preservation. I will not get too into this just because it really depends on what you have access to. Um, I don't want to get too into details in programs that other people are not actually using. It's not that interesting. Also, just to note that as an archivist, I would be responsible for accessioning and processing collections. And as I've mentioned, we have an in-house digital lab. So I would hand off the files and the finding aid, and they would do all of this. So this is not actually my domain, but it is a preservation talk. So this is sort of the basics of Evo digital preservation infrastructure. While collections are being worked on, they are stored on in-house staging servers, and then they are ingested with all associated metadata into Rosetta, which is the digital assets management uh, program that we use. So we create both access files and preservation files in Rosetta, and then the Center for Jewish History, which is the, the partner, we have a partner, we're part of um, a five partner institution at the Center for Jewish History, the Center for Jewish History administers all of our IT. So they use Dell Power Vault storage arrays and tape library systems in multiple physical locations, and they back up all of the staging files and all of the Rosetta files daily. We also have a tertiary backup system, and that's Glacier through Amazon Web Services. That's in a separate physical location, and that's also administered solely by Evo, not through the Center for Jewish History. So that's our third sort of backup of all of our digital files. Uh, material is discoverable via Primo, which is our, our skin, the, discover, the discoverability layer that we use in Rosetta. Primo and Rosetta index to search engines like Google. In terms of fixity, Rosetta automatically runs checksums. So that's something that's automated for us. We don't do that ourselves. And that's, if you have questions in the Q&A, um, I'm happy to talk about that more, but that's sort of the basic bones of digital preservation here. All right, so thank you for listening. As I said, please feel free to email for the slides or if you have any questions, if they're Evo specific, you can use my email, my Evo email. If there anything else, you can use my Missouri email. Um, and now I will pass it off to Melissa for Q&A. Awesome. Well, a round of virtual applause. Thank you so much for that really fascinating conversation. I'm sure that our participants have a lot of questions. So participants, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question if you'd like or type it in the chat and I am happy to ask it for you. Um, just keep in mind, we are recording this for playback later. So who would like to go first? Gary, maybe, do you have one you want to start with while everyone finds their unmute button? <laughs> oh. Well, I have to say much of this was new to me because as an archivist from who started his career in 1968, uh, we, we didn't do a lot with digital preservation back in those days or digital collections. And this is, uh, you know, a whole new age now. Uh, and I, I just find it amazing that, you know, we're talking about this kind of thing because uh, I can remember before there, you know, how archivists tried to deal with collections before there were computers and we were typing finding aids and things like that on typewriters. So uh, I don't have a specific question, but I just wanna 
to say how appreciative I am of, of expanding our universe uh, in, in this topic. And uh, I hope that, you know, we'll have more, uh, more talks that relate to preservation of digital materials in the future. Yes, Hillel's agreeing with you in the chat. And I think, Gary, that goes too to show the importance of continuing education and of these programs uh, like this one today. So let me read a question here from Tom. Tom asks, Hillel, you didn't archive the books that she used, but did you keep a list of the titles? Yes. <laughs> I don't, I think I accidentally unplugged my camera. I'm not quite sure what just happened. Um, but that was what I was responding to. Um, I did oh, okay. see the titles, yeah. <laughs> okay, you don't worry about the camera. We can hear you perfectly. Okay. So that's the, that's the important thing. Um, I have a question here from Tim. Will the retirement of Microsoft Edge impact this process or workflow? I don't think so. Um, the only time that Microsoft Edge comes up is with the, the, Google, the Google archive that you can request from Google um, and that, sort of is out of my control. It's whatever we get from Google, but I have to assume that they would account for that <laughs> without being able to confirm one way or the other. But I imagine that that is part of their, their whatever they'll deliver would still be available. Okay. Rachel asks, can you go over again the way to download comments in the Google Drive format as opposed to rich text? So let me screen share, actually. And okay. while you're screen sharing, Halal, I'll just remind everyone again, this will be on the Monmouth University Department of History and Anthropology YouTube page. If you want to go back and refer to any sections of Halal's talk, I will put the link in the chat. Sorry, Halal, go ahead. No, so my, can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, yeah. Okay, so my Zoom is not, responding so okay. i'm not going to screen share but i'll talk through it okay so the the rich text comments is something that you can do yourself once you have the collection you just literally you go to file download as rich text and you have whatever you want the the google drive archive with those separate comments from the donor you even if you have access you can't download them unless you created the documents so the donor would have to go, I think the link is takeout.google.com and they would just ask for an archive of whatever folders they are donating and they would then get a zip file that they could send to you. Does that make sense? Anyone have a follow-up question or, or did that make sense? I also put the link where you'll be able to see Hillel slides. Okay, Rachel saying thank you. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if we went over this one. Can other browsers perform the edge function? Do you know, Hillel? Uh, no, I don't know offhand. Sorry. Okay. okay, no, no. These are all things we can all go back and research afterwards. <laughs> I do have a question. Um, Halal, have you looked into um, the issue of obsolete uh, file formats and being able to read old digital files that may not be um, easily translatable with current software? Yeah, so that's actually, that's part of um, the isolated workstation and the technology thing that we're not quite set up with yet. There are usually, I mean, there are, for. As far as I know, every sort of obsolete format that would come up, there are physical disk readers that you can use and you know insert those into your computer and insert the, the format into the, the reader. But we're just not super equipped right now for any of those. But that is part of why we would ultimately like to have an isolated workstation and be able to have all of the hardware that we would need to read obsolete formats in one place. And that is also, I have to say, part of the part of the importance of a write blocker, because oh, there are certain obsolete formats where if you open them on a on a format, like on a modern computer, they're basically corrupted immediately. So at least in the initial phases, while you're figuring out what you actually have 
you don't want to open anything. You want to use a write blocker and just read so you don't accidentally open a file that can't, that will, by opening it will be destroyed. Hi, here's a question from Jessica. She writes, I know you didn't use it, but can you share the script for exporting the file tree in Google Drive that you referenced? Yeah, I, I, I will put it in the chat when my Zoom fixes itself. Oh, <laughs> you can't use that either. Oh, I'm you're sorry. All, you're all blurry and it's just a, uh, just a spinning wheel of doom. So I, but like I said, that is, if you want to email me, I can also send you the, the file, the presentation itself, and the link to that is in the speaker notes of that slide. And hello, I'm going to go ahead and put your email in the Zoom for everyone, right? It was on your last slide, so I'm not giving away any no, no. <laughs> secret info or anything, but I'll put that okay, in the chat go. since you can't. <laughs> you. Go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay. All right, so the contact info is now. I see Ellen waving her hand. Ellen, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I had, um, it's actually for the, um, for the Princeton Preservation Group, uh, more um, a question. Um, but did you say the Princeton Preservation Group was related to classes in the Princeton, like, um, ice school of the ice school? Is there an MILS program at Princeton, or is it? What, what actual academic department was the um, starter, the originator of this um, seminar? What, like, what was your professor of what subject? The, uh, the Princeton Preservation Group has never had any relationship with Princeton University or any other university. It was, it's called Princeton Preservation Group because uh, the founder, Susan Schwartzberg, lived in Princeton. And that's where she would hold meetings in her home um, and she worked at Rutgers University okay um, so, and we we initially always met in Princeton even after we moved out of her house but uh, since uh, her death in 1996 we've we've met we in live programs all over New Jersey um, and this but this is our first online program Okay, so she was a professor of, of information studies at Rutgers? Yeah, I don't know if it was called that at the time, but yes, uh, that, that's what she was. She was the preservation librarian there. And before that, she was director of Alexander Library. Oh, so she was she more, not that it really matters is that of curiosity, was she um, in a more of a librarian role or a professor of information studies? She, not, but she taught the class at the in the uh, graduate school uh, for librarians uh, and she also was on the staff of the library. Okay great thank you. I'll go ahead and put uh, PPG's website in the chat as well for anyone who wants to read more about the group and isn't familiar.